So you've been painting for a while and you never know if you're done. You think maybe just a handful more of the perfect strokes will make it just perfect. They'll take your painting from just okay to masterpiece status, right? Come on, I know you're thinking it, but I'll say this, all of that head stuff usually leads to overwhelm and a muddy mess in your paintings. Am I right? So yay, today we're sitting down with Sarah Simon. She's right there. <laughs> uh, and obviously you probably know her as the Mint Gardener from Instagram. Friends, she's got that like beloved, iconic, edited style that we've all become so familiar with. And that style has garnered attention from celebrities and hundreds of thousands of students worldwide. So uh, the fact that you're here today with us is a huge honor. Thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, the honor is all mine. It's such a treat to be on your show and to get to paint <laughs> with you. I believe she's the master of watercolor restraint, knowing when it's done. And honestly, it's a topic that mystifies so many of us. Monet would mull over a single brushstroke for hours, but that is definitely not my brand of joy. I wanna know how to create wow compositions with only the brushstrokes necessary. And I wanna be able to do it in kind of a quick amount of time. I wanna walk away confidently and not take a year to finish a painting. So let's get into it. So today we're going to chat, we're going to paint, and we're going to figure out how to get to powerful, satisfying watercolor results that we feel really good about. So Sarah, at the time of recording this, you recently released your fourth book. And I, what I want to know, yeah, that. <laughs> so what I want to know is why did this book need to come into the world? And what significance does it hold for all of us in the watercolor community? Christy, I love that question. Thank you. So I really felt like there was a need in our community to provide a little bit of a stepping stone to get people to actually sit down and paint. Composing a watercolor piece is not just about getting paint on paper. There's so many attributes of a composition. There's color, there's drawing, there's subject matter, and all of those things can stand in the way. Um, I feel like we're really pro at procrastination when it comes to actually physically sitting down and creating. And so if you can find a reason to stop yourself, like saying, oh, I'm not that great at drawing, or I love drawing, but the moment I get the art on the page, I'm scared to paint it because I might ruin it. That was why these books were so important for me to make. It actually took me about two to three years to convince my publisher that printing watercolor books that had actual watercolor paper with my hand-drawn pre-traced drawings inside would inspire people to actually sit down. It would remove a stumbling block that often sit in many of our way. So by having a book that has you pages of instruction, showing you the foundations of watercolor in the beginning, plenty of room to practice, to swatch out colors, to learn those foundations, and then how wonderful to have actual art drawn on the pages on watercolor paper, it immediately removes the composition issues, the drawing fears, and you get to just sit down and watch paint move and shine on your page, which is what we are all craving as a watercolor community. So I just adore that because I also have a heart for that. So I had submitted a proposal for a wedding book. It was called The Painter's Wedding. And in that time, I got this idea similar to yours, but still very different. And my publisher is a smaller publisher and they they like jumped on it and it involved the same. I, I wanted people to um, get past that fear of the drawing and all that, you know, because I hear that all the time. Christy, I can't draw. I I can't draw. Now, whether or not they actually think they can draw, it's more about the fear and that 
stumbling block that you mentioned, right? And so I think it's so interesting too, however, your books I adore because they go a step further than mine. Yeah, you get the the drawing and the composition and that stumbling block is literally erased, but then you get the color palette suggestions and you're seeing a finished piece. And I just, I just adore that. So I always say, just put brush to paper. I always say that. I've been saying that for years. However, we're giving people the tools to do that, to literally do that without all the hangups, right? Correct. So when I first began teaching, I quickly learned that was the first thing people said. It's like, I can't draw. I can't draw. And it was kind of a way to either remove themselves from the creativity um, or like, you know, we said a stumbling block. So I was like, okay, how do I reverse engineer this? Um, I was actually an economics major. So yeah, this idea that I have a goal of where I want people to be and end up and then figuring out how to get them there. And I almost think of it as like a, a full complete body, right? We've got our skeleton holding up all of the the beautiful bits, but without our skeleton, it would be kind of, you know, it would be a floppy mess. So watercolor can kind of look like a floppy mess if you don't have good bones. And that was my way of when I would teach, I'd be like, look, here's the finished product. This is where you're headed. You have the line. So even if your flowers tend to look like watercolor starfishes, it happens to the best of us, right? The lines will still be there. So at the end, you have practiced your watercolor skills. You've played with color. You've seen paint move and shine, but you also have an end product that you're still proud of that is a flower. And you have the lines so you can trace them again. And while you're tracing, you're working on your hand-eye coordination. You're building, you're building muscle memory, right? And so you're learning to draw and paint without feeling like it's going to take me a lifetime to learn to draw. So when do I get to paint? So you get to do them together. So I'm curious because today we're talking about, you know, doneness and that, that mystical, mysterious knowing when something is done. How could this book help someone overcome that fear or better understand how to, you know, stop when it's the right time? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, these books are intended as workbooks. So the intention is for you to paint this and then trace it, put it on the light board, right? Or hold it up to a window, trace the art again, or, you know, sometimes there's great sales and it doesn't hurt me to, for you to buy a few more workbooks, right? <laughs> uh, but what I've learned over the years of watercoloring is there is such a feeling that if I make one stroke, it can mess the whole thing up. However, if I don't take the risk to make the stroke, how will I ever know what my next potential is? And this is that fine balance between good being the enemy of great saying, oh, it's good enough. It's good enough. And every watercolor can always be good enough, but you don't know until you try to add that second glaze or you live on the wild side and add some magenta to your color palette, which you never would have thought. So by trying these papers, these little projects, a few times, you the first time you follow the instructions, you use the color palette. The suggested one. The second time, maybe you lean in a little bit to that intuitive voice and you go, I'm going to choose a different color than Sarah suggested. Right there, you are moving into your own personal style. You're learning more about watercolor. You're learning more about you. You're learning about what you want to say. And knowing when you're done, if you have to ask yourself if you're done or not, Trying it again and doing it one more time will tell you, you'll get a little bit closer to knowing what is done for you right now and what is done for you maybe, you know, a few years ago. It changes. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I love that you're giving folks the flexibility 
trace, do it, you know, you really, really like dig into this, make it, make it, you know, dog eared and, and, and loved and yeah. Okay. This is where we get into it. I've asked you to teach me in your style to sketch your favorite thing. And so let's get into it. Friends, you know, I love to be taught. It's like one of my favorite things on this channel. And um, I'm not going to hold back when I'm nervous or feeling like super not confident about what I'm doing. So yeah, stick around. It could get interesting. And then I'm really curious, Sarah, like when you are sketching or illustrating, I don't, your, your pieces cannot be called sketches. <laughs> Sorry. They they're, are. They're so refined, but that's a compliment. But how, when you're sketching for watercolor, knowing that you're going to be adding washes, right? And that's part of the whole vibe. I, I'd love to hear just how you feel done with the sketching bit before you move on watercolor. Yeah. So let's get into it. Okay. I love this question. I think that your posture as a lifelong learner is like such a healthy mindset. I love that. And I am often trying to do that as well. I actually have designated this year. I'm feeling like this bubbling, like I'm like, okay, I'm going to deep dive into some different things that are a challenge for me because if I'm not constantly learning or challenging myself and art and we just stagnate, right? So feeling uncomfortable. I often feel uncomfortable drawing, full disclosure, but uh, one of my main favorite drawing tips that I teach to people that come to all of my retreats, uh, my classes, um, I generally have a thing of post-it notes in my purse and a pen or a pencil at all times. And you find yourself waiting a lot during the day. I'm not an incredibly patient person. Everyone assumes I'm very patient because I watercolor, but um, I have ways to get around uh, being patient in watercolor. Hint, I work on about four pieces at the same time. So do you do the same? Oh my gosh, like I'm sitting here, you're saying all these things, like we wait a lot. I talk about having a magic cup and like stashing supplies everywhere where you exist. And yeah. then like, I'm not patient, I usually have like 10 paintings going at a time. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. I, I, I give myself that permission because I feel like watercolor is one of those mediums that it, if you give it a chance to respond back to you, the piece only gets richer and better. And our, you know, go to in society is finish it and do it right. Get it done the first time. But I'm like, you know, I really feel like this one needs a color or something that I am not able to access right now. So she goes on my wall. She yep. hangs there. And then I work on another. And oftentimes I'll work on two to three pieces that are very similar. And often one, I'll, I'll take the risk and add some magenta to this one because I know I have two or three other pieces that I'm working on that are similar. And that is how... Each piece just gets richer because they inform the other. It's also a really great way to not keep things precious because you never know which one is actually your practice piece and which one is your final precious piece. So you're allowing yourself, you're inviting yourself to play, I think. And that ties really into drawing. So post-it notes. Um, I also have like little sketchbooks that I'll bring with me. And some of my sketches are pretty terrible, right? Um, I did some last <laughs> night at dinner. No. Okay, okay, okay. Can we get a peek in your sketchbook, please? Totally. Don't, this is not one of my good sketchbooks. But I will talk a lot about drawing with sketchbooks because that's kind of where you have to give yourself the permission to create bad art, right? I have a really hard time with that because I feel like if I'm creating bad art, I'm wasting my time. It's a little bit, it feels a little bit like doubt. Like, oh, maybe I'm not actually an artist. Like, I'm just pretending. And the mint gardener, she's cool. She's my alter ego. She hangs out online. And she only puts up her good stuff. But it's like, I create a lot of really bad art. And if I didn't give myself the permission to do that, 
especially in a beautiful sketchbook, right? These are so stunning and I'm like, ooh. But if I treat it like it's precious and I only create beautiful art in it, then I'm not growing. So I do create absolute crap art, but I have to sketch it out first. And so a lot of the drawings, I don't have all of my sketchbooks with me, but a lot of the drawings that I allow myself to create um, or that eventually end up things that I would make a masterpiece in watercolor, they start as really goofy little sketches in a book, okay? So my botanicals and kind of organic shaped themes are a lot more refined and more what you're talking about in my drawing style. But it's mainly because of the muscle memory I've developed over the last 10 years of sitting in my garden, observing the flower, yeah. drawing the flower, and then painting the flower to actually draw a piece, to sit down. There's so many sources, right? Um, we both have kids that are moving constantly. So this en plein air, joyful, I'm going to sit there three hours and observe the light changing and try to capture the movement. Goals. Goals, right? Not Monet, not today. Yeah. And you know, Monet, I, sorry, Monet, not today. I'm a little bit just friends. That, um, he sure. He, oh, and also, let's be honest, he had, uh, a female taking care of his children, um, a few servants, right? So he could sit there and watch the light change in the lily pad, you know, not handing in Mane, incredible work, right? But he was also older when he was creating those and he didn't have tiny little kids running by knocking over his easel. So, and plein air painting is possible and drawing with kids, hence the post-it notes. I usually bring stuff so they can be entertained. Um, milkshakes, Really great, great idea. Um, this is what we did. Back. We, yeah. So we were sitting in Rome and I'm like, I, to fully embody this moment in Rome, I really want to draw this fountain. Um, and there was a cafe. So I bought very large milkshakes for my children. And you know, they can't drink it too fast because then they get a brain freeze. So I'm like, yep. okay. That'll slow you down long enough that I can sit here and actually sketch, right? <laughs> we we learn to work our angles, right? So I would say if I am going to sit down and plein air, that is how I'm going to sit down. And I my sketchbooks are going to be continuous line drawings. They are okay. going to be multiple lines. It's going to be with whatever tool I have. I prefer colored pencils actually to sketch um, live. I feel like the color, usually like a dark blue or a light blue, uh, blue is very calming for me. And if I'm sketching in a color, I release that perfection. Oftentimes using a pen or a pencil feels like there's it's too performative. I'm like, oh, this is too close to what it could be in its final form. So it doesn't allow me to play. So colored pencil. I can go quicker. So oftentimes if I am live sketching and I have the blissful pleasure of indulging in that colored pencil. Now, when I was leading my painting retreats back this fall in Seattle, um, we had time to take a photo, flip it upside down, make it a grid, turn it black and white, only draw shape. Um, I feel like oftentimes drawing like those basic tips, those are like, you know, the flipping, making it an abstract. Oh, that looks like a mountain range. Oh, that looks like a C shape. Rather than telling your brain, I have to draw a sheepdog. Uh, your brain automatically goes, oh, here's a sheepdog, right? From yeah, some right memory. Ow. <laughs> right? Right? So we're drawing from some sort of memory or recall. Um, and often that is not the most accurate. Drawing what you see rather than what you think you are seeing is that switch you have to make in your brain. So drawing a shape or a recognizable shape often makes a truer piece on your paper. And if that takes turning it upside down, making it black and white, gritting it, those are all really great tips to just draw from a photograph or from life. Um, 
But taking a photo with our iPhones uh, and then making all those adjustments is really great, which, right? Yes, I do that. I recently had a video, actually, we'll pop it up here about on plain air because you were talking about on plain air. So if you want to kind of get my tips on on plain air, go ahead and it's going to be down in the description below. Uh, but I talk about using your iPhone as a compositional tool and actually not trying to, you're on plain air, you're outside, just enjoy the fact that you're outside doing the thing. You don't have to actually look at the thing outside. You can take a photo and look at your phone and use that and then use what you see and then use your phone. I talk about that all the time. So friends, check that video out because that will, that video will help you understand what Sarah was just talking about in terms of reference and breaking things down and abstracting things to better understand the shapes and what you're drawing. And also what I just said a little bit there. Um, I love that. I use my iPhone all the time taking photos. The grid um, uh, on the iPhone is fantastic. I'm sure it's on all the other phones too, but you know, I'm an I'm an iPhone gal. Two things I want to put a pin in that you said. Number one, I loved, and I just want to draw more attention to what you said about this contrast between how I said your your illustrations are so refined, but you're like, but no, this is where they start. They start and you have that page open of more abstract and it filled, it was like, you know, a full spread in your sketchbook. And it was, it, you know, it was much more organic and thicker lines and juicy watercolor. And it actually gave me such peace to know that that is kind of where you start and where your mind is at um, over the years and as your skill has developed, that that often is your starting point. Did I get that right? Did I understand you correctly? Absolutely. It is still my starting point. Um, we can absolutely still trace. I am not a hater on tracing at all. In fact, if, if there's something tough that I cannot seem to translate, I have no problem getting a little tricep workout against my window, printing out my photo of it and tracing it. Oftentimes that's where that aha moment goes. It's like, oh, my perspective was way off. I, I didn't give enough room between this pedal fold. Like, oh, there it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, you captured it perfectly. But I think allowing myself to freehand draw in sketchbooks, on post-it notes, in any anywhere I can, it develops a personal style mm -hmm. that's different than tracing. Because tracing, there's a precision to it, right? Where you're you're copying a line, where there is this wonky style that's all unique within each of us, and that's where allowing yourselves to make the kind of wild continuous lines until you get a line you really like um that helps us kind of hone and refine and sometimes the wonkier bits are the better actually i have a really great example of that yeah no, let me grab this. so i put these on my instagram pretty recently and this was just me going for it with a paintbrush and three colors right yes so Form has always, like, how a person moves and looking at different shapes is fascinating to me. I did not think I could do this. It was a free-flowing day. It had been kind of in my mind a lot. And so I was like, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to go for it. And everything in me was like, no, you should probably, like, pre-draw first. Mm -hmm. So, but I was like, you know, I don't get time for that. I'm just going to do it. And if it's crap, I don't have to share it. Right? So I did this one free form, this one free form, and this one free form. And then I was like, you know, I'm going to go back and I am going to pre draw because there were some proportions that were off a little bit. And that was, I was looking at my just go for it. And it was kind of bothering me. So I drew it and then started painting it and realized. I actually liked the wonky bits yeah. where I allowed myself the free form. And I was like, all right, yes, the pre-drawn ones are more accurate. But are they more expressive? Do they evoke the same feelings? And I was like, you know, I felt that. I was like, 
I was like, I was really hoping, I really, friends, I did not know she was going to show these. This is not scripted. And so she I showed their feet form. And I'm like, I really hope she did a one pre-drawn because I know, I just know. Because I got chills when you showed the first one, the free form. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to like the pre-drawn one better. There's just no way. And I didn't, no offense, but I didn't. I like the free form better. So, and that again, gives so much peace. And friends, I hope it gives you tremendous peace as well. Yeah. I started a lot of my work in watercolor drawing um, my form. I like to call her Florence. It's the hashtag is Florence and her fascinations. When I first started watercolor, I would just kind of like sketch with a paintbrush and hope it looked cute. Yeah. Um, but again, this is like pre-books, right? So I had no idea really what I was doing. Um, it was very much play and I did it very small. And I remember painting these eucalyptus leaves and going, well, great. What, what comes next? And how do I even, there's just a bunch of leaves on this page. Like, how do I give this a foundation, some kind of architecture? And I was like, well, I could draw a vase. And I was like, how about a person? So I started drawing this person, this woman, her name, I named her Florence, but it was only her arms and her torso. And she would always be in black ink, but I would start with pencil and erase yep. a million and one times until I finally got it to what I wanted it to say. Then I would ink it. And always she was in black line and her fascination was the watercolor in color. But so I've been drawing form for 14, 15 plus years. So jumping right to paintbrush, I didn't even have the confidence to do that. But then turns out practicing a lot it it does help you yeah you know right yeah. crazy um but i will say that like the the drawing the precision in my drawing that you see now that you are so kind saying you love it really it really starts with a lot of mistakes and a lot of you know i'm going to draw now i know here's a really fun tip now i know that drawing a figure if I get an arm drawn and I'm like, no, that's a little wonky. My first step is not a racer. My, my next step after that is actually try the line again while the old line is there. And if it's not quite right, I draw it again and again and again. And right. Maybe there's 10 lines to make really two for an arm. But yeah. until I get the two that I want, my eraser is nowhere near me. And then I, I ink. Look, I call right? it the loop. I, I, I always say to folks, if you feel yourself getting into that eraser loop where you like, you draw and then you're like, no. And then you draw and you can feel the tension start in your shoulders, the tightness in your chest and the eraser and the no and the eraser. I love that. And you're giving us a tangible example of how to stay out of that eraser loop. So I'm just like so happy about that. So how does Good. this all tie back to talking about being done? And I think we're creating a big question mark here because these feel very done. And they yes. are like, done for you, right? So what are your thoughts on that? And I promise, friends, we are going to sketch. She's going to teach me how to sketch a yes. little bit. I'm going to just do that. Right now. But this is such gold. So if someone is feeling like they want to go beyond this page, onto their, dare I say, life page. Yeah. And, and, and just venture into this space with this style. Right. Like, I'm guessing you're, you're, you're saying probably get a post-it and just start loosey goosey there yeah or better yet just start writing your workbook i mean it's okay. not like right it's not okay. like page 48 of your foxes sure maybe you want to frame it and you know celebrate it when you're done but if you had a few extra leaves that you've drawn and added there or if you're like no i don't want to mess up my precious page Let's just do some drawing over here. It's great because it's all watercolor paper. So you can draw and to continue that idea. So you've got like 10 lines making yep. up. You need to. So Sorry. for I me, I interrupted you. 
<laughs> no, no, you did it. You did it. And all <laughs> this is creative communication. This is all of our, these are all of our pencil lines. That was not an interrupt. That was like an aha. Uh -huh, and I'm thrilled that I said something meaningful. So I'm, I'm stoked. So, okay. So what I would do is I, I'm going to look, let's pretend like, you know, a leaf. Let's, let's get down a little closer. So I'm going to lightly sketch a leaf. All right. Then I'm going to go around a little bit. I'm not worrying that I've got lines interrupting lines. The idea is to be looking at length, width. I'm measuring things with my eyeballs. Of course, there's fancy ways of doing this that we don't have time for. But I'm recognizing shapes. I'm creating lots of lines, right? And then here, this petal interrupts. So we're gonna do petal. Petal. So I'm, I'm a lot of observation skills. I would say when I'm drawing, I am actually looking at what I'm drawing more than what is actually happening on the page. Um, but that again, takes time to build that hand eye coordination for your, uh, hand to do what your eyes are seeing without double checking with your eyeballs. Um, but I'm just kind of playing with shape and perspective. Now I understand curls and petals, right? I, it is a little draw, it, easier drawing your own drawing. Yeah, um, right. Is that surreal? <laughs> yeah, that is a real thing. It's just like putting on, you know, your pants versus borrowing some. It's like, oh wait, this doesn't fit quite the same. Um, you just understand things certain ways, and that's all again part of your style. But so I've got all of these multitudinous lines, right? And I don't quite know where things are connecting, what's happening. So if I've got multiple lines like this, and then this would be in my sketchbook. And then I'm like, you know what? I really love how this leaf turned out. And I really love how this flower turned out. So I would come back and I usually, I love using my microns, which of course I have none nearby. But what I would do next is I would go over the fine line in my micron. I would do my, my line, my true line in my micron pen. And are you still at this point, like editing a little bit? Yes. It, yeah. I, I am going and I am finding my one true line. Now there's a little bit of editing and then there's also a little bit of trusting like that my original lines might be truer and more beautiful than when I'm coming back. And can I just say there are some days where I'm a better drawer than others. And I don't know if it's amen with that. Right. I don't know if it's oh sleep or right. Or maybe something I ate that made some magic drawing skills. Right. Okay. But there are some, <laughs> you never know. Right. Um, so I would come back and I would eat. With my, with my micron, the line that I want to keep, all right? Love that. Now, I found giving it about a few hours just to let that ink dry um, before I come back with my eraser. So when I sketch, it's many, many lines. It's pencil, and I come back, and I erase it. Um, then I ink. Then I paint. And so paint. Love it. That's... That now... Some people, which I follow some watercolorists, they don't ink. They just watercolor right on top of these multiple lines. That's and it's not going to, right? And it might not give you a clean look, but my God, it gives you kind of an organic, beautiful look that I'm, I'm into exploring. I'm not, I don't always have to create in this style and I love it, but there is something really beautiful about a looser flowing organic look, right? Yes. And I honestly, like what I'm starting here, I may not even erase. I like, I'm maximalist, messier, fussier. And I like some of the bones, the skeleton here of the pencil, yes. you know? So, but I love your workflow here, this process of you're almost like, um, is it fair to say you're kind of thinking on the page with your pencil? with these multiple lines and and seeking that I wrote it here the one true line. I feel like you're you're literally thinking on the page. 
Yeah, that's a really good way to say it. It's thinking on the page. It's also, um, it reminds me of Hemingway. I don't know how much Ernest Hemingway you've read, but his, no, some enough. of his books are, yeah, not enough. Some of his books are pretty heavy and dark and I have to read a chapter and then intersperse it with my fairy novels or whatever, <laughs> right? But A Movable Feast, it was published posthumously. So it's a collection of several chapters that he wrote about his life when he was first starting to write. And so he has chapters from when he was actually in Paris as an undiscovered, unpublished writer. Okay. And those chapters, when he talks about seeking that one true sentence and that he'd bring his edits over to Gertrude Stein and she'd be like, it's great, Hemingway, but you're saying too much. Just say what it is. And I tend to be verbose and I love extra adjectives, but I don't actually like to read, right? Extra adjectives. So that actually, that, that's that been a lot of the writing processes over the years, right? Learn yeah. just one true line. What is going to get it the most clear and concise um, but that translates into other art forms and watercolor is one of those. I think watercolor is in its most beautiful. Like you look at John Singer Sargent's watercolor sketches. Mm. It is one true paintbrush stroke and he reserves the inside of the alligator's mouth and somehow the alligator is, it comes alive off the page with one true stroke. So I'm, while I'm sketching, I am thinking about that one true line that I want to eventually ink, which will, it maximizes your impact while minimalizing the work. I love that. And it, I, I just, friends, I, I want to take a moment here to say, this is why I bring other artists on the channel. Because you said something just a few moments ago about like, when I was commenting on how I enjoy the skeleton of the pencil and I might leave it there in watercolor, you know, and I am the opposite. And you might want to explore that. You had said something like you might want to explore that. Right. And I want to explore the opposite, you know? And so it's so important to be teachable. It's so important to always be pushing yourself outside of what your norm is, what your comfort is. And so I am, wholly fascinated right now by this one true line concept but the thought that when you're drawing and how we're in plein air drawing is something that's quite a privilege right not all of us get to enjoy that uh, and I think it's fascinating that when there was the advent of photography all of the artists were absolutely panicking thinking it was the end of painting when really it is, it only became a tool that enabled more to enjoy it, which is so powerful. And I think that as an artist community, there's like a lot of freak out about anything new, like Instagram or TikTok or, oh my gosh, AI. AI, like, I knew it. I knew you were following like, there. as you did. It's, it's just another tool that, artists will morph and change into becoming something that only furthers the expression of ourselves. We will never be done with a paintbrush. Never. I'm so glad you said that because I've been wanting to tie this, this conversation back to this idea of being done. And I'm about to get all like philosophical, I guess. But maybe that's the point. Maybe the point is that we're really never done. We are just every day, the tools are becoming more robust, whether it's our iPhone, whether it's our own skill that's evolving, whether it's AI, dare I say, I know people are super nervous about it, no. but these tools are just giving us more ways to communicate, more ways to understand, more ways to evolve and develop our skill, you know? So absolutely. And as artists, I remember it was really cute. I went and did a an art class lesson in my daughter's second grade, completely unprepared for how, of course, it would change me, which right. I went in going, oh, this is a labor of love. But not only did the entire class start 
singing a song together as they were painting and the teacher and I are like weeping and they were it was a Martin Luther King Jr. and they were learning a concert song and it it was we will we will love we will overcome like okay so I'm weeping as people are there these children are one started it and then they all started singing as they're painting it was this incredible moment but one of the boys at the end, they were like, what? Well, you know, do you have any questions? And one of them said, what is your favorite painting you've ever done? And this really ties into, are we ever done? And my my gut reaction was, it's the one I haven't painted yet. It's the one I'm dreaming of. Because the moment it comes into creation, that magical unicorn that you're chasing is gone. And Part of the draw of sitting down and creating is always pushing and learning what you can do in the next one and capturing that, which once captured, the magic is already percolating for the next thing you want to do. So I don't ever feel done, ever. And part of that is kind of like the joy of creating. If if the joy of creating something new goes away, which sometimes it does, it's part of the creative cycle. There's parts in my life where I'm like, nope, don't want to pay. Don't know if I ever paint again. It happened. And then the next month, it's this torrent of ideas and your hands can't keep up with your brain, right? And that's an amazing, that's the coveted part of the cycle. But the very real other part of the cycle is I'm never going to paint again. I'm, I actually suck. I don't know what I, I don't know what I was thinking. I'm not a painter. But knowing that that magical unicorn out there is out there and maybe it's a different medium maybe it's a different subject matter but just that that invitation to always come back and try again that is that means you're never done and i think as artists we are never done and ever you're right and i get it you know we're talking about the technical idea of being done but at the same time at the time of this recording we're nearing, you know, a new year, right? We, we, I think there's so much to be, to be drawn from this conversation, even the comparison of the technical aspect of being done with an illustration, being done with the painting, being done with the com composition, contrasting that with, but how much does it matter that it's done? Yep. And we mentioned this earlier, but what is done today in my style in three or four years from now may not be done or it might be overdone or overworked right um and that's where the beauty of creating side by side so let's say you have my workbook let's do some practical are you done i always suggest doing two pieces side by side so you have this lovely little fox maybe you freehand draw a fox next to it Okay. Right? Using those little skills we just played with, draw a hundred lines to get those ones that you are confident in, right? Or if you're not feeling that, trace it. There is no shame. Um, no shame in art, right? And paint, paint them side by side. Start with the leaf, do it one way and the other. If you're feeling it and you like it, do it again on the other page. If you're like, no, I could have really done some more green, more, maybe I want these to look more like fall leaves. So playing with those side by side, you eventually get closer to done. And one of my thoughts is, am I done? Um, stepping up, walking away, grabbing a cup of tea is really helpful. Um, putting them away once they're dry and coming back and double checking. But when you work side by side, knowing that one is done and one still needs to work, maybe it needs another layer. Watercolor people often stop at that first layer and they go, huh, why does mine look yeah. kind of precious? Kind of, kind of like flat, not very saturated. That's when you come back with another layer in watercolor. And another, and another, and hmm. another, right? Given everything we've talked about, and I do feel, I feel like we could talk for hours, days. Given what you've seen of folks that you've taught, the few they have, the hangups, the, the, the roadblocks that come up again and again and again, uh, 
I'm sure like I see daily, you know, DMs and comments. I'm so, yeah, you know, I see things like Christy, I, you've inspired me to think about trying this watercolor thing. And I'm sitting there like, well, what are you thinking about? Why, why aren't we doing it? So my question is, what do you want the world to know about watercolor? Watercolor is not scary. I think that's what I want people to know about it. I think uh, it's gotten a bad rap. It's kind of like the middle sister and between acrylic and gouache. Um, people have seen it, well, in the old days, we'll go back to the 18, 1700s. People saw it as a sketching medium. It wasn't recognized in a Paris salon as right as acceptable <laughs> submissions. You had to have an oil, right? There were certain rules, um, which of course Monet and his crew debunked. However, not so far as actually enabling watercolor to enter the realm of professional mediums. But watercolor has always been around including gouache. Um, it's one of the oldest painting mediums. It's one of the most approachable. I also think with it, also with it not being scary, it's also really accessible. If people were to just give it a try. It's one, uh, one of the reasons I love watercolor is because it always welcomes you back. This is a medium that can be so easily animated with water and literally your paint, the medium freezes on your page like a bookmark in your favorite book. And you can walk away and then come back an hour later, 20 years later, it's right there welcoming you back. Like, you know, you're the best friends that you don't have to worry about checking in with daily because I'm sorry, I can't maintain those kind of relationships. I can barely maintain that with my husband. But <laughs> the friend that's like, we had that unlimited time together when we were young, and now we have fits and starts on Marco Polo, um, or hey, we're going to turn 40, let's go to Jamaica. And it's never a question of are we friends still? It's like, heck yes, high five, give me your top three. What can I be praying for you for? And ready, go. And that's the way, the way watercolor is for me. It's 100% this best friend that always wants me to come back and hang and play because she's just right where I left her and she's ready to hang all the time. I just are that. I don't have enough words. I don't have the right words to express how you've captured even my own feelings about watercolor. It's, it, it's, um, it's quite it, I, like, I get, I get, I get the tingles a little bit, you know, because just kind of saying it in a different way watercolor is that easy friend that you can even ignore a little bit you know yeah and, and they don't take it personally they completely get it because their lives are just as wild as yours yeah and that's where this medium i really feel i tell this to my classes is i feel like watercolor is a bit of a dance we're we're a we're a player in the dance we are not in control of the mark. The mark is constantly changing and responding. And, you know, my watercolor in South Carolina looks different than my watercolor in Washington because there's, right, there's different humidity in the air. Uh, so watercolor is, uh, it's a constant communication between the artist and her tools. Uh, and when you approach it, like it's not scary and almost kind of open armed and realizing that watercolor is being open armed to you. So you can, you can let this paint spread and move and maybe go where it wants to as it's drying. And the end product is going to be more beautiful than if you tried to control it perfectly. Isn't that such a great analogy? Like for good friendships. Indeed. In I guess. I just, yeah, I feel very calm when I watercolor. I'm, I'm my happiest when I'm painting. And how fun to be able to sit down and do it together with you. This is like we're hanging out having coffee. I know. I love it so much. Me too. All right, friends, you always know on this channel, it's a conversation. It's not only about what I'm saying or what my guest is saying. It's about the conversation going on in comments. 
So let's get it going because who knows? Who knows? Maybe someday down the road, uh, we're going to get together again and maybe we'll answer some of your questions and paint them out, paint out the solutions. So get into comments. Let us know what's on your mind. And while you're at it, if we've entertained you, if we've inspired you, if we've given you that final kick in the butt you needed to actually try watercolor or get back to watercolor, would you go ahead and give this video a boop? If you're new here, a boop is a like, friends. And I'll be honest, you know, the YouTube situation is always interesting and making sure that the folks that need to find this video find it really relies on how many likes a video gets, which is crazy, I know, but tis true. So if you want to help me out and help my channel out, uh, go ahead and give it some love. Give it a thumbs up. Give it a boop. Thank you so much. A lot of people feel concerned about adding another layer because they're going to mess it up. But that's where good is the enemy of great. If you don't add another layer, you'll never know if you could have hit greatness by one more color or one more depth of layer. But you leave one as one layer. So if you mess it up, I'm using very heavy air quotations, then you have another one that you didn't add that extra layer. And you're getting double the practice, double the fun. I love you're done. And you're writing right in your workbook. Yes. So it's supposed to be uh, I'm, I'm messing up your page real good. Good. So what keeps art I had is done is a process. That's it's a personal, personal process. Yes. Done is a process indeed, my friends. This conversation has proved that. And, you know, you might need a little more proof that it, it is just this open-ended experience and that you've got to just get over the fact that maybe you just won't ever be done. So watch this video next if you need more proof. And until next time, you know what I'm going to say. Happy painting.